Let's continue our regionalization. We're going to continue with precipitation frequency. All right, so um, like Derek, like a lot of this comes, we got a lot of this information from uh, the hydrologic meteorolog hydrometeorological uh, design center, University Corporation for um, Atmospheric Research. So basically, a lot of this comes from a, a big um, HTCU NOAA presentation. So because we are going to be talking a lot about NOAA 14, that is our primary uh, easy source to get to precipitation frequency. So, <clears throat> all right, learning objectives. We're going to talk briefly some differences between flow frequency and precipitation frequency. And we're going to define re regionalization, look at that a little bit more. And then, of course, we're going to jump into NOAA Atlas 14, um, talk a little bit more about how that came about, what it is, what it, what it looks like, what we can use it for. Um, most precip precipitation frequency studies are going to be point rainfall data. So there's a process we got to go from point to the basin size that you're looking at. So that we have an aerial reduction factor we'll look at. Um, and then we'll talk about how we actually uh, develop and use it in flow frequency. Um, and then if you haven't heard, you know, we, we talk about an AP, AEP neutral concept. We'll kind of cover that and what that means. And then I'll briefly talk about um, RMC's tool, uh, rainfall runoff frequency tool. So raft is basically what we call it. So stream flow and precipitation. There's a difference. What is the difference? What are some differences? Anybody? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. So I, I mean, some basics, right? Like uh, stream flow is measured at a point for all the area above it, right? It's all the flow that comes to that point. Um, stream, but precip is a point. It's only good for that particular point. Um, you know, you have tipping buckets, you have radar, but everything's like it's a point. Pre it's point data. Um, just generally speaking, stream flow comes from USGS primarily. There's of course districts and agencies that have their own gauges, but most for the most part, we come we get it from the USGS. Uh, precip gauge can come from a lot of different sources, not just the radars, but a lot of different other kind of gauges, networks, and other kind of past ways of getting it. But, uh, you know, really a lot of it's being rolled up now. I, I, hopefully people are using or looking at the ARRC data, um, the, the way to get gridded data from at least, was it 79 forward, you get hourly gridded data that's incorporating a lot of all that information in it. But so... <clears throat> For the most part, the GS tries to meticulously QC their data. You usually don't find erroneous data. You still find some things here and there, of course. Find some rating curves that are off. Um, precip data, on the other hand, over time has had lots of different measures of quality. So the older you get, especially with the radars, you get some really mm, inaccurate results that you might not even know you're dealing with. So with precip, there are better sources now today. Always try to verify, you, you know, you can get volumes off because the precip itself is off. Um, historical data, payload data, is a lot easier to um, calculate or develop with Streamflow. It's um, really kind of difficult to recreate um, historical, especially paleo, historical events with precip, right? Like you're gonna have a particular amount of information to be able to reconstruct uh, a precipitation event and uh, historical. It can be done if you have enough, an hourly here, some daily there, some mass curves, some top lines, something that you can peel back together and you can recreate it, but it's a little bit, usually a lot more difficult. So, it, I mean, there's just some differences, but again, some of the biggest practical reasons that we do this is just the availability. Um, for the most of the US, you've got Atlas 14, readily available, you can pull and use in a matter of minutes. And the Northwest, they've developed their own precipitation frequency up there. So it's accessible now if you're up there in the Northwest. So pretty much most of the, the, the most of the country, it's the all 50 states plus a couple of the uh, islands here and there has precipitation frequency. Um, and then again, like with SKU, we're talking about trading space for time. So you have limited time, I mean, add side data, so the idea, again, is if you incorporate all that um, precipitation data time series in a region, you're effectively increasing the overall time based, you know, with added space 
in concept, you're reducing your uncertainty. Now it's not one for one. If you have 100, if you have 50 gauges with 100 years record, that's not 5,000 years of effective record length. Okay, so there is, you do have uh, coincident or uh, correlation that you have to factor in. So, but anyway, the main point is once you do that, you can take a record that's 80 years long and extend it, the effective record length, you can extend it beyond the actual systematic or historical record that you have with additional space for time, like precip. Um, and of course, with Bayesian, um, and what we're doing with BestFit, it's very easy to incorporate this into um, an analysis now. Uh, we have some spreadsheet forms of doing this. I think take about a day or two to get through, maybe a little longer. Um, and then we have the online tool that takes just about as much time. So within, if you're first through time through it, it might take you a week, but the, the reality is it's just a, a couple of days and you can have, um, or a day or so, you can have uh, informed volume frequency from the flow, from uh, precipitation. So it, it, it can be pretty easy or quick. So, <clears throat> so regionalization. So at this point, like a, a meteorological observation describes a spot that the observation was taken, right? It describes that particular location. Stream flow is different because of course, it's at that point of observation, it's the stream on the stream, it's the result of everything in the watershed up to that point. So with regionalization, we kind of got to figure out how to group together areas. So this is up in the kind of the Northwest. Again, it's a good example because they did all their own site-specific regionalization recently. But anyway, the point is you got to look for similar physical relationships and you can kind of, parse that out with some statistical measures and, and some and defining those uh, to get relative because you want it, your your models to represent the physical world of those particular areas you don't want it to be too broad but you need it to be broad enough to capture those different areas so <clears throat> you'll have variations and that's okay um, but like I said like each area might be a snapshot of that particular type of precipitation frequency you get in that area so um, like back in here, I believe this area is on the other side of the mountains. You know, these are not, uh, these are on the ocean side of that. But anyway, the point is like, do a precipitation frequency like Atlas 14 or new site specific ones. You kind of have to regionalize and figure out the, through statistics and different physical characteristics, you can figure out what areas you want to lump into together. So in general, NOAA, NOAA Atlas 14. Um, so again, the Hydrometeorological Design Study Center, you know, they updated these using a lot of different information, a lot of additional supplemental um, information that goes along with this. It, of course, supersedes the old ones, the TP40, 49, even NOAA Atlas 2 in some areas. Um, it was based on, of course, since it was done so much later. Some of them were done many years ago, I think like volume, 11 was done in 17, 2017, 18, but, uh, you know, much longer record lengths, a lot more stations were incorporated into this information. Of course, a lot more robustness to the statistical analysis that they did. Um, first couple volumes, they were working it through. So uh, first couple volumes, a little bit questionable. We'll use the data, but just know that if you're using volume one and two, you, you need to have a little bit of flexibility with what you're using. But beyond there, they started really perfecting how they were doing them. So. Um, but again, it, it, through the process, they developed a wide range of durations and frequencies along with uncertainties. So, um, right now, like I said, there's 11 volumes It covers most of the states plus the, uh, a couple other islands out in the Pacific. Um, but these are individually like kind of funded and done at different times with volume one, of course, being the first one, volume two, the second. I think the volume 15 process is supposed to be a three to five year process. It'll be a complete update of everything. It's, it's this volume 14 process, the ones that they kind of perfected and plus additional things with climate change, non-stationary. They're going to have a couple other factors to make it a little bit more robust to be used, not just like we use it now, but also for any kind of future considerations. But I believe the first test site starting up in 2024 is going to be up in the Montana area. Up in the, so, I, that's what I, but I don't, I mean, I couldn't tell you too much more. A lot of this is just being developed by the, the councils put together. But like I said, the plans is, I think, Montana 2024, and from there, like a three to five year period and have it complete, everything completely updated. That was 15. So, but for now, we got Atlas 14. So, 
what may, what's if you haven't used these, what these are made up of. If you got durations um, from five minutes through sixty days, and you got the the AEP, the frequencies from uh, like a partial duration one year up to the thousand year. So it kind of the op a little bit opposite of volume frequency curves, right? Like the one year is the low down here, and the thousand years at the top, where when you volume frequencies as you increase volume, they go down anyway because these are points, those are averages. Um, so this example shows a point in New York, and this is just the table. If you if you got on the website, this is just the table that you get when you select a point. You you get the a, a, basically a table of the generated precipitation frequency. So like on this one, it's 100 year, the 24 hour. It gives you the the best estimate, the 5.26 inches with the fifth and 95th percentile. So you can pull that out. There's supplemental information with all the GIS data if you wanted to process this in ArcGIS or Met, HEC MetView, tools like that. Um, I'll tell you later, like in RMC's online tool, Raft, it's all done internally, so we don't have to process data anymore, which saves a lot of time. But um, it's full of uh, a lot of supplemental data that has, you know, documentation on it, the maps, temporal distributions for the region, um, seasonal charts, other data, rainfall estimates. It's got a lot of things in there, so it's kind of good to get in there and play around with the, wherever your area, if you are going to use regional, this information to understand what, how it was developed and what else is available in that area. So again, like I said, available products in this area here, you can see is like the grids, the maps, time series, temporal distributions, and just kind of other documentations, but it's all built into the website. It's pretty nice and clean to use. So again, overall, the A14 process basically started with data collection as any process does. And like in the Northeast, they, they basically had 7,000, roughly 7,600 stations um, that they gathered data from. So from there, they get to go through a screening process, you know, examining the spatial locations, looking at for duplicate records, looking for unreliable records, just QC in the whole process, right? And then from there, they, the, the analysis approach uh, is based, so they got to base it on annual maximum series. So they got to get the annual maximum precepts from there. So for each station, they, you know, extracted out the highest precipitation amounts for any, for the particular durations they were looking at. And of course, after you get those, you got to quality control that information. And so then from there, your depth duration frequency curves are built at individual stations and, you know, then compute that with the statistics over the uh, regional for a regional frequency of the annual maximum series. Um, so all of that was 14 volumes are of course subjective and, and it will be the same thing with 15 uh, for external peer review, which of course provides a lot of good feedback and then they adjust for that. And so then of course we get our final products um, published online. But I don't know if you can see like there's a annual max of series here, the, the kind of the spatial data, here's your uh, depth duration curves, and you produce kind of that grid at the end. So you, most people might have probably seen all this. Uh, so, <clears throat> and just for clarification, like just like any study, there's going to be a pretty good level of uncertainty, and it might be good for you to understand what that kind of uncertainty uh, can be. So just looking at a couple of topics, you know, there's Data error, station link there, spatial area coverage is um, so examples like up here. This is a record length, so change in the record length from uh, I forget how long the record length, but length in the record length basically changed it from a six and a half inch to seventeen inch um, rainfall, just lengthening the the record length. So uh, on the bottom left, the the one hour annual maximum series is for Ithaca, I think New York. So, and this one, they found hard copy data that they added for this red data. And of course that lengthened out the record. So finding additional data. So it ended up almost doubled the uh, rainfall for that area for the hundred year. So you got things like the top right, where you've got a snow melt that was included in the precipitation frequency. So it's included as a liquid rainfall, right? Instead of snow melt, which kind of really helps. I mean, that's a huge event up there affecting the, the frequency, which was actually snow and not rain. So there's there's things like that. You just got to be um, 
understand it kind of goes into the they, they try to sort through all that and understand that's what goes into the uncertainty that you're getting with the fifth and 90th percentile. So frequency analysis, you know, themselves also have, um, you know, they have some other types of uncertainty kind of with the distribution selection. So over time, the different volumes use different dis distributions. So the choice of how to parameterize the method, stationary, non-stationary effects, you know, regional me method effects, optimization of the depth duration frequency curves to maintain consistency. So there's some smoothing trends and interpolations. Um, but basically like, like there's examples like it, this top left figure, all seven of the, uh, the curves statistically m m match the data it could be used, but there's a huge range, like at the hundred year, not too big, but by a thousand year, the way the curve split. Um, you know, if you use Pareto versus GEV, you're going to get a big different split on by the time you get thousand year distribution, but they can be both viable through the actual data you have. So uh, it kind of makes a difference. All right. <clears throat> so we have precipitation frequency. Again, most of it's almost always going to be um, point rainfall. I think the other, the next NOAA versions are going to be point rainfall. Um, so with that, we can't apply a point rainfall to our watersheds for rainfall runoff process. Um, they got to be uh, converted to the watershed size. You know, you know, if you, you can't take single point depth and apply it to some area, you can try to calculate the point depth for every point in your watershed and apply that, but that's way too much effort. So there's just a simpler process of taking the point and reducing it so that there's for the aerial size that you're looking at. So it's aerial reduction factor. So here on the left, we have like just the classic HMR 52 aerial reduction factors. Um, they're really built for extreme storms, but it's a pretty handy um, estimation for very quick or early uh, level analysis. Um, something simple like, I think this is the, if you're looking at the, the 40, for the just over a thousand, let's say it's 1200 square mile basin. At the 48 hour, you get roughly 0.76 aerial reduction. So you would apply 0 0.76 to your precip, and that would be what you use. Scale, that's, that's the depths you'd be using. So there's other studies, of course, that have been done. One of the ones that we like that was uh, uh, recently done, maybe a few years back, for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It was done by uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, they went and developed maps. Uh, they, they broke the, the states into regions and they developed I think, 18 different regions. And they developed one, two, three day, 100 year error reduction factors. So this, oh yeah, there we go. There's some arrows. Um, so this right here is the same region curve. So this, instead of showing all 18 carriers, this is just showing the same region that this, this same watershed was. So for 1,200 square miles off of this curve, it's roughly 0.85. So typically when I've, almost all these I've looked at, it's somewhere around 0 0.08, 0 0.1 difference between the NRC's curves. They tend to be about 0 0.08, 0 0.1 higher than HMRs. But these are based on 100 year for the 100 years, these are based on extreme storms for PMPs. So you get a different shape to storms the bigger they are versus the smaller they are. So it's kind of a nice balance to know what the smaller events at 100 year air reduction is versus the extreme events. You know, there, you have some play there within the uh, some sensitivity, some play. That's a big difference in volume if you think about a tenth of a, uh, you know, a, a tenth of 10% more or less reduction to your precept and might have a kind of a big difference in the volume in your final product. So you're going to pay attention to the area reduction factor. If you go to a higher level study, um, you really should do your own uh, analysis for what that region's uh, area reduction is versus these uh, coarser, coarser looks. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the HMR 52s are based on primarily everything from, I guess, in the 60s and earlier for the most part. And then 
the NRC study was based off a lot of information here recent all the way up through recent time off of gridded information. So um, for our lower studies, like our base level, if I was doing something for a PA or for early studies that were just trying to get um, some understanding of the risk and understanding of the volume frequency, I pretty much use the NRC study. And I, I use the HMR just for sensitivity, but I rely more on this one. So that's what we tend to recommend at this point. So we have some spreadsheets that just have all this digitized and built in and just we can pull the data out pretty quick. So using the precipitation frequency to inform flow frequency. All right, so we've got some hydrographs. So the first thing we really wanna do is take those representative hydrographs, the storm patterns, um, and, and we wanna scale those. So you have your depths, you have what the, whatever your critical duration is, and you wanna scale your hydrograph so that that critical duration is equal to the depth of the AEP you're looking at. Typically, um, since we, we like to put in uh, three quantiles for our flow frequency, so we usually use the 10 year, 100 year, and 1000 year. There is some variation you could do that, but that's our typical. So you'd be scaling a hydrograph depth through your 10 year precip frequency and your 100 year depth and your 1000 year depth, so all individually. So from there, you know, we use a calibrated validated rainfall runoff model to route that through so you can get your runoff flow hydrographs. And then, of course, we'll take those resulting hydrographs and calculate our average, our volume, our volumes that we want to uh, insert into our flow frequency. So you can have, a, if you had a four-day volume, or four-day critical volume uh, study that you're doing, maybe you have a two-day critical precipitation, you run that all through, you still got to calculate the four-day volume from those precepts to be able to enter into that volume frequency. So... <clears throat> So again, I just just pointing out like uh, one of the big factors in this process is the error reduction you apply. So just know that if you use the ones that we pointed, there is error in there, and you, you got to kind of make sure things are <laughs> uh, coming out right. And I'll show you. So after applying like the the meteorological data and getting your runoff results, um, it's kind of like we're doing a brute force Monte Carlo. We're kind of hand jamming it in a little bit. But the main point of that, the results, especially if we're doing a 10 year and a 100 year, is you want to be able to see, recognize that your results for the 100 year and your 10 year and 100 year should line up reasonably well with your observed data. Like they shouldn't be way up above or way below. And so if you've applied rainfall, error reduction, you've got your scaled hydrographs, you route them through a model and you're really off on the plotting positions from here, that's pretty much a red flag that something's not right. So now thousand year, that's a different, it's a different story. You're not gonna have data out there to really qualify that, but you kind of should have something. There should be some red flags in there if you're really far off there. All right, so let's walk through the base level rainfall runoff analysis. So it's kind of clear what's happening. So uh, with, with any study, you're gonna have to determine what the critical precipitation duration is. and of course, like I just mentioned, like this is not the same thing as your critical volume frequency. Um, they can be the same. You can have a two-day critical precept and a two-day critical volume. You can easily have differences. So one day with a three-day, or two-day with a four-day, five-day, something different. So they're not the same thing. Um, you want to identify multiple hydrographs that you want to look at. So typically, we try to find at least three, but you know it's okay to find more but you want varying temporal, uh, temporal and spatial patterns, so different hydrographs to be to actually scale up and, and run over your watershed. Um, and sometimes we go ahead and move some storms uh, not on there, over the region that's we're developed somewhere else. We go ahead and move them over and do some, some magic with that as well. Um, <clears throat> so, again, you'll, you'll want to determine the the base and average hydrograph so that what's the what's the critical duration um, for this I'm just trying to see if this thing yeah so your hydrographs might have rainfall outside of the period but you can usually figure out from enough of them what the actual um, primary critical driver is now if it's you're getting a lot that are two day or three day or one day two day you might run out both 
if you have the right number of hydrographs, but you don't want necessarily want to take a 24 hour hydrograph and apply 48 hour or 72 hour depths to it, right? So you don't, you, you want to make sure your hydrographs that you're applying are kind of equivalent to the durations. However, if you take something that's like 30 hours, something that's outside that 24 hour period, and you apply a 24 hour depth to it, it's only going to scale for the most, as long as you do this right, it's only going to scale the 24 hours um, for that period. You just don't want to take 24 hours and apply it. 48 hour depth to that 24 hours. You can apply 24 to the 24, just knowing there might be some little bit ancillary rainfall around, which is okay. You just don't want to scale more than what you're doing there. But usually you take, like I said, you can start with three, but I usually try to collect as many of those Heidi graphs as you can get. Usually it's easy to pull those out of HMS. You already got a calibrated validated model somewhere. You can go grab those real quick and look at them and you can kind of filter through um, what the primary critical duration is. So once you kind of know that critical duration size, um, you'd collect the precipitation frequency again from Atlas 14, and you apply the aerial reduction factor, um, as we discussed earlier, and this provides our rainfall depths so, so that we can scale those hydrographs too. Um, and now <laughs> you want to develop those scaling factors for the hydrographs. So based on the precipitation based on average precip, so um, as compared to your hydrographs. So just example here, the basin average is for the 24 hours precip for that high graph, or the 24 hour precip is 3.1 inches. Um, so that's your, your actual height graph. The basin average aerial reduced A14 for the 100 years is 6.9 inches. So that's a 2.2 scale factor, right? Just a basic scale factor. And that's what you would scale your, that temporal pattern up to. So pretty, pretty standard, just scaling it to the, so that you get the right volume. So note that there is, there are, um, there are, there can be precipitation outside of the critical duration, um, but that doesn't get scaled. So, because, because of the AP, AP, AEP neutral concept, you don't want to scale more volume than what you're supposed to. So anyway, we want to try to hold the AEP neutral as much as possible by just only scaling the duration that we're supposed to scale. So, all right. So it's important to evaluate multiple hydrographs and vary your loss rates, loss rates at least vary your, so you can vary more hydrologic parameters, but we wanna vary at least some hydrologic parameters like loss rates, uh, just to add some uncertainty with what we know what the runoff capacity could be along with the difference in rainfall depths. So, it's also important to evaluate the multiple AEPs. So, like I said, we do 10 year, 100 year, and 1,000 year. Add the other ones in to help not that big upper one not have so much weight on um, so much leverage. So, by adding a couple other ones, we, we were able to keep that thing from having too much leverage as well. And then we also, like that one picture we saw, you can also kind of verify your results are giving you something reasonable with the 10 year and 100 year kind of matching up. Um, again, the goal of this modeling is to just reasonably represent, you want reasonable representation of uncertainty. So uncertainty with, so, cause I mean, like I said, some of the largest sources of uncertainty is just in those depths and your hydrologic runoff. So, um, but underestimating or overestimating your, your precip runoff results and your, standard deviation, your variance within that can really have a lot of effect on where your flow frequency curve is. And we'll look at that in a later presentation. I'll show you some examples of how you can really move the curve around. Um, so this plot, the plot on the right here um, shows a volume frequency curve calculated with systematic and historic inflow data. So the colored points, if you notice in there at the 10, 100 year, 10, 100 year and 1000 year, those are our just volume frequency runoff results. Um, there's essentially there um, represent 20 different, 27 different runs for each AEP. So there's, because we've got at least three different hydrographs and three different loss rates. And then we're running three different precip. So upper, middle, and lower precepts. So there's, you get up 27 
just if you're doing this manually, kind of brute force Monte Carlo manually, you end up with like 27 events per AEP. So it's 81 total events if you're kind of manually calculating it. We can always beat that up in the spreadsheets quickly, but that's our standard like spreadsheet work. Um, because again, if we're in the core right now, we have an online tool for Raft, you can generate 5,000, 10,000 in minutes at this point. So. Yeah, so I think the question is, given the the results from the precipitation rainfall runoff results, right? They, and if you're looking at the overall volume frequency at that point, is there an indication that if you had more data, would it have been towards the precip or not? And um, yes and no. Uh, no in the fact that there's still a lot of uncertainty in your actual depths. We're trying to account for it, right? With the, the range and precip that we look at and then the range and hydrologic parameters, but there's still some uncertainty there. The data still drives the overall main answer. Um, but in this case, like, it's not like it, this is, you might not have, so the AEP neutral concept we'll talk about in a little bit, like it might not hold as true at the 10 year. So I don't, I try to get this close, but it might not, it's a little bit harder to hold that true. But by the 100 year, like, that's not too far out of line. It's not too bad. Um, if it was way out of whack, if the precepts are way up here and the data is down here, I probably tend to lean, lean towards something's wrong with the hydrologic model. Something's gone wrong in the process uh, more than you just need more data. Now, I have seen where, like, you, you do an analysis and you look at these data points and you, you kind of go back into the preset that created those data points and they're like the biggest event on in history was a less than a 10 year rainfall. So I'm like, okay, so your watershed has had in 70 years, according to Atlas 14 is less than a 10 year rainfall. So that either tells me like either the, the regional rainfall doesn't represent your watershed or that watershed just happened to miss the big rainfalls and can still potentially get it. So then you got to decide what's more appropriate, the, the, the rainfall, regional rainfall or the data that you're given, because it's just, and so you're just going to have to, you, you do the sensitivity, you take the more conservative side. If it's driving your risk decision, then you got to dive into that and figure that out. So, but I have seen definitely studies where these events are, the highest events are small comparative rainfall events. We plugged in some precip to bring it up, to bring it into, for the region, just to give us a better look of, for, risk informed decisions. And then if it made a difference at that point, we can, we can look more into it. But yeah, most of the time you'll see them, they're pretty within line. Sometimes you'll see them, they're not at all. You got to investigate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So three, so we've got a variety of inputs and routing are to provide kind of a reasonable representation of our uncertainty. Um, from those uh, simulations, the, we get the average, uh, so we get the mean and standard deviation from each one of those AEPs. So that's our quantiles, our quantile priors. So using the hydrologic model results, we calculate the range of uncertainty and, and the inflow volumes informed by, of course, the precip frequency for each of the AEPs. Um, you can see like there's a, or most likely with the range. Um, so. The, the big thing to note is right now, the way we uh, apply that into best fit is we apply it as a normal distribution. So, you know, it's a mean and a standard deviation for normal distribution. So just a simple normal distribution. So this, so if we take that now and we kind of flip it on its side, roughly this is what that represents. So this is different than intervals. This is... So this is, that's not it's the same thing as a historical interval. So a historical interval just says, here's an upper and a lower. This interval says you have a normal distribution through that, through that area. So that means a lot less likely on the tails of a normal distribution, right? Than through the, the middle portion of it. It does. Well, it looks like it does, but it's not, right? It's laws. Yeah, so in the next version, we're gonna add different distributions so that you can put in something other than a normal distribution. Because the reality is 
it's not normally distributed. Um, but right now it is normally distributed. So you do have same distance down, same distance up. It's just in log. So, <laughs> but, but that makes a difference. Like right now, again, so your LP3 curves have to fit through this normal, di normally distributed um, precip quant this quantile pri uh, prior. Whereas the other one was just said, how likely is the upper and lower intervals given the, given the curve? That's a different statement than your curve has to fit through there. So it's, it has a different influence than the intervals. So they go out for a long time, but what is the probability of that? Like 0 0.9999? It's, yeah, but a very, un, like outside the 90% quantile, right? Like certain, it's a balance. Yeah, it's a competition. It's a balance between um, the weight that the uh, systematic data gets, the, the intervals and that, yeah. So I'll show you some examples where I could force the curve to do really funky things because of this normal distri distribution it has a strong influence so when but the reality is a lot of our we have pretty wide uncertainty we tip you're you're going to tend to see that your uncertainty on these precip these quantile priors are larger than your historical intervals like if they're if you're getting real tight certainties on this you've probably done something wrong you didn't factor in something so that's but that's the thing is like you, you do put pretty tight standard deviation on this you're going to get a tight 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 curve and it's not really, that's not representative. I can guarantee you that's not representative of the uncertainty you know in the, the preset frequency in your runoff. So, um, all right, where are we at? Okay, the EP neutral concept. So, the basic concept of this is that the, the AEP, we start out with the precipitation frequency, we route that through the project, we get the volume frequency, we get our uh, Info hydrographs, we calculate our volume frequency. That volume frequency is assigned the same AEP that we started out with the precip. That's AEP concept. So it's one to one precip to flow. So that is generally true for smaller watersheds, especially 1,000 square miles and less. You get bigger up to 5,000, probably still okay. You start getting bigger, you're going to start to see that start to deviate at some point as you get larger watersheds. And, and like I said, at the 10 year, depth compared to your loss rate, the, the ratio of loss to depth is a lot smaller. It's really small. So um, the, the volume out here is pretty much primarily driven from your preset volume. The loss only has a small percentage. So back, back over on the, the, the one year, back over here, you might have as much loss as you do precip or half of it. Like it has a lot bigger effect. You don't have an AEP neutral. So like I said, at the 10 year, you can have a, the 10 year you can have, depending on your project, you can have pretty good weight between uh, ratio between late with the, the precip and the loss. And so it might be a little bit more not AEP neutral, but usually by the hundred year. So the idea here is like, so you have your volume frequency curve in the blacks. The blue is the A14 straight curve, just the precip converted to flow. And then this little green curve right here is that dashed blue line with a loss applied. So just kind of the average loss you get for the watershed. So you apply that to that middle blue curve there. And so down here, you see a big difference in the loss to the precip. Um, up here, the, basically you're getting really close to like, it doesn't really matter. Like the, the overall volume is driven by the precip. So at that point, you get really close to one-to-one -one precip to hydrologic runoff. So that's our AP, AEP neutral concept. Not always true. You got to verify it. The larger wash sheds, um, you definitely got to verify it. But for the most part, it holds true for a lot of our studies that we do, especially smaller watersheds. And there's our arrows. Understanding AEP neutral, it's just a one-to-one -one ratio something you got to just verify but for the most part we we use that concept basically graph has five parts one pulls in precipitation frequency or you can put your own if, you, if your area has its own fre precip frequency you can enter that in next part next thing is that you're able to sample that precip frequency it uses a stratified and important sampling we'll talk about that later on because uh, rfa uses the same type of sampling but essentially 
you can you take the preset frequency, you can sample that um, into a bunch of different events and bins to be able to actually sample for your stochastic model. You plug in your HMS model, which should be calibrated, validated, so you can be able to route that. Um, and then you run as many events as you need. So roughly you know, 5,000 events take three to five minutes. So if you wanted 10,000 events, you can do a stochastic model pretty quick and get, generate a lot of different um, data points. And from these stratified sample results, these are each individual runs, you can create a total probability curve. So from this information, um, you can, if you, if you had a dam, especially a, an army dam, a, a NRC dam, something, something small that didn't have a lot of data, you can quickly produce a stage frequency curve from rainfall. Um, you can also produce loading curves for different reasons, but this gives you a quick way of actually producing uh, stage frequency data for projects that don't have a lot of data. So we can use this in an unengaged area or somewhere that doesn't have information to develop um, everything you need for a risk assessment. But for most of our projects, which have tons of data, we're looking for results to take and add to our volume frequency. So we can generate a whole bunch of data and get a good big uncertainty around each of our quantiles um, and feed that into uh, best fit. So we now have, this is stratified sampling. We can sample um, full uncertainty along the quantile, or we can do the full total probability um, uncertainty and, and build one of these uh, total probability curves with uncertainty now. So it's got anything you wanted to do off of precip. So it's precip with your HMS model. If your HMS model has somewhat reasonable reservoir routing, then you're going to get a reasonable stage frequency out of it. It's an online, it's an RMC online tool. So there is some things proceeding, hopefully through FEMA, that we can make this available to the nation. But it runs on Amazon cloud servers and it's on the cores servers. So we can't allow others access to it at the moment. Probably never will be. So we're looking for options. We, we, there's a possible option in the near future through FEMA to make this accessible for anybody. So, but we have to get around a lot of bureaucracy hoops. If you've got a, if, you're, if your reservoir point has multiple reservoirs right upstream and you really need to know, I run both, I run unregulated and regulated. You can run them in systems, so you can run it in the exact same order. You can build your, I, I'm testing this now. You can build your unregulated regulated relationship using a stochastic approach. Um, from these examples, because you can run the exact same thing. So you'll have your total, you'll have everything you need for regulated or unregulated, whichever way you want to look, you'll have your relationship. Um, but some projects you may want to run it as a system, apply your precip and do things with it and get different results as a system operation. Um, different purposes, different things you can do with it. You can run it with or without, depending on what you're trying to do. But I believe um, we can build a much better stochastic unregulated regulated relationship instead of manually doing that through this now. So we talked about differences in stream flow and precept. They are different. It is a different process when you're coming up with critical durations for volume versus precept. They are different. You need to look at them differently. Um, you're going to most of the time just understand like this, a lot of this data is very accessible. And like if I review somebody's periodic assessment, if they haven't used it, if, it, if I think they can apply something, I can show them how to do it and pretty quick. I have some other tricks through this process that I can apply in about 30 minutes to apply to a flow frequency. Um, showing them tricks other than doing this full calculation just to kind of give you an idea of where it would be, how it would affect your precip. So because there's data readily available, it's really easy to apply uncertainty based on precip um, to your volume frequency. Um, and then we've got Spreadsheet tools and like the non-core people spreadsheet tools, we use them in the core too, but we have the wrath for those that might want to do it online.